Hello everybody and welcome back to my ranking of the Elden Ring boss difficulty. If you haven't seen part 1, check it out via the link in the description. We left off with the difficulty really starting to heat up. Today things are going to burst into flames even hotter than some of FromSoft's most tremendous challenges. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Number 15, Valiant Gargoyles. Blackblade Kindred has appeared a lot in the game as an enemy, mini boss, and now duo boss under the name Valiant Gargoyles. If you ask me what heroics are involved in double teaming the player, I have no answer for you. The question I ask myself, having already encountered them thoroughly throughout the game, is what new do they bring to the table? Poison spit that not only yields the draining status, it persists on the ground inflicting damage. This eliminates any potential greed strategies. Instead, you're constantly bounced in and out of range while these inflated bats barf more than a sorority post-bachelorette party. Beyond the poison, each is equipped with two weapons, meaning double the moves to learn on top of a massive hitbox size and blistering speed with their wings. The sword and axe can lead to some dicey combos, but they can't hold a candle to the twin blade. It's as if the possessed soul of a Dark Souls 2 record holder emulated their inner wind blade all over your face. The mini boss in the Forbidden Lands can delete you instantly with the flying whirlwind. With a poison, twin blade variant, gank, and respectable challenge of these enemies on a base level all combined, it's easy to see why they'd be here. The one thing holding them down in higher regard is their passivity. As a duo, one generally chills and spits periodic poison, allowing for a moderately assisted one-on-one. -on -one. In my single fight with them, there was never a moment where they ganged up on me. That allowed me to think of it more as one gargoyle with an extremely large health bar. A proposition that was plenty tough, but not enough to compete with the difficulty juggernauts still to come. Number 14, Godskin Noble. Never have I seen a greater mismatch between stature and speed. This bloated behemoth moves faster than his apostle counterpart. His thrusts are not only quick, they have incredible range with minimal gaps in his deadliest combo strings. You never get true reprieve either due to the quick cast fireballs. Noble even has a second fire attack, drawing a small circle around itself. This can trap you at devilishly close range with little recourse for evasion. If it were merely phase one, he'd probably rank similarly to the Apostle. What elevates Noble well beyond that is his second phase, where the Apostle gains deadlier attacks at the cost of more advantageous openings for the player. The Noble's transition is all game. He now has a quadruple thrust with multiple hits per barrage, demolishing blocking with airtight gaps for evasion. His burping belly can smack you backward, while the extra bloat often has him soaring upward for a monstrous ass quake. While these are spooky, you have not experienced true terror until you see this hippopotamus stop, drop, and roll, 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 and roll! All the while, he can do a 180 on a dime to ensure you get blubber up your butt at least once if not twice! You can use the pillars in the arena to block it, assuming you react and position yourself in time. Due to my finding this legacy dungeon late in my playthrough, I did have the stats and experience to handle him without too much trouble. Let's just say I'd already faced him elsewhere to get a strong impression on his real potential. For that, Godskin Noble poses enough of a threat to thrust himself toward demigod difficulty. Number 13, Godfrey First Elden Lord. Big, angry axe spirit abuses local tarnished. At least that's how it felt dealing with a more complex variety of combos than I was anticipating. His model reminds me of something like Velstat. While Bellboy's moves were moderately slow with wide openings, Godfrey's strength is the mix-up in his attack strings. Without many attempts of careful study, it was stressful trying to ascertain when he was open for attack. Mix that in with my personal propensity for greed, and you've got a recipe for trouble. Seeing a split-second opening, I said go immediately, while he said, You triggered my trap card! Those blunders inflicted heavy damage, regularly putting me on the defensive, scrambling for a healing opportunity that may or may not have actually been there. When you finally find a window you're confident in, if you don't capitalize quickly, he'll leap aside and counter. He often starts combos with an earthly stomp and a forward cone that staggers, leading to a world of pain. This is further exacerbated by the classic long tell, quick delivery that demands memorization of attack timings. If you can read him appropriately and react accordingly, this is similar to the boomer bust battles I described last time. For a first playthrough at least, he boomed me more often than I'd care to admit. And let me tell you, boom is an apt word for the first Elden Lord. Number 12, Horaloo Warrior. Here comes the boom. Ready or not. Boom, 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 
I hope you like roaring explosive blows because that's all that's on this 12 course menu of primal devastation. Being the corporeal form of our previous entry, Godfrey's first phase deviates from that formula in a few ways. His slam can now tear the earth asunder, creating an initial hit and explosive after effect. And he has a power up signified by a massive roar that inflicts damage, turning his conal stomps into massive arena wide AoEs. While experience does pay off, he's still tough enough to throw you for a loop before an entirely new phase 2. Actually, you know what? Who needs a beast help when you can become the beast and enter Ultra Warrior Instinct? This WWE massive man with open palms and mighty stomps fancies himself ripping you to shreds with his bare hands like poor Soroche. He's got more than enough power to pull it off. Just watch him lift the earth enough to cover up half the arena. He's not all ground though, no sir. Watch him powerbomb my blue turtle into the next century. If the off kilter timings of a single axe threw you off before, you're now expected to watch his hands, feet, and mouth for punches, kicks, stomps, roars, headbutts, the works. The ferocity and delivery speed of each blow is more than enough to keep you on the ropes, not to mention his insane pursuit outside of the roars. Which stun at close range by the way, so it's not like that's an opening either. While the difficulty was high, his placement near the very end of the game means you've likely been hardened by tougher foes already. That in his first phase is only a slight variation on a previous boss. Despite respecting his difficulty overall, my honed bleed build was enough to hemorrhage him out of the top 10. Number 11, Crucible Knight and Misbegotten Warrior. A sour difficulty note in a part 2 almost exclusively comprised of awesome demigods, this duo of mini bosses precludes your path to Radon's festival. Worth noting if the festival was underway when you arrived, they can be found upon reloading the area afterward. Not that you're missing out on anything. As you begin, you're faced with Misbegotten Warrior, a reskin of Leonine from much further down this list. After a moment of fighting him, Crucible Knight, a mini boss and later fixture standard enemy, flies in to gank you. While this ranking isn't centered on quality, suffice it to say this battle feels like two enemies designed separately, carelessly tossed into an arena. This matters for difficulty because you're faced with two boss caliber enemies with little regard for balance. Crucible Knight is one of the harder mini bosses on his own, essentially a great shield silver knight. He adds a handful of wrinkles such as magic flight and tail slaps to stand out. His meter to Aggression between blocking, staggering, earth stomps, and considerable reach with his greatsword combos makes for a tough battle, let alone while you're being ganked by the speedy misbegotten. What saves them from a higher spot aside from the sheer grander difficulty to come are the few seconds you have to melt the warrior. Thanks to chaining staggers, it's fully possible to eradicate him before Crucible Knight can even take the stage. I had enough power to make that happen, so this didn't destroy me as harshly as it could have. Even so, it wasn't reliable enough to avoid a hearty handful of beatdowns, elevating them just outside the top 10. Number 10, Margit the Fell. Seems my network test notion that Margit would be a mid-game boss was half true, as we'll soon see. Unfortunately for newbies and veterans alike, the semi falsehood had left Margit in all of his glory awaiting you before Stormvale Castle. You, on the other hand, had none of the gratuitous tools that that demo offered. Instead, you're left at the mercy of your own open world progress to define Margit's difficulty. While some out ear completionists like this overpowered fellow that beat Margit in three hits exist, the majority of us will stumble upon Margit rather quickly. What a rude awakening. For the newly initiated, the phrase, when is it my turn, sums up the experience quite well. In the first phase, the bulk of Margit's offense centers on his staff, a polearm with incredible range. Through his variety of attacks, he asks advanced defense of the player your skills will likely fall short of being so green. That's putting aside how quickly he can continue combos with a conjured dagger that will do damage through blocking. Running away to heal is massacred by these daggers through tosses as well. While you can stagger Margit and time parries at key moments to diminish the length of his second phase, it's incredibly daunting no matter when it occurs. With much more aggressive and lengthy combos featuring his new hammer, Margit's offensive capabilities skyrocket. You can still get semi-reliable windows of opportunity after his rear and dash attack, though it can be done in sets of one or two at random. His hammer slam is another good time, though that can be quickly followed by his four hit wombo combo with absurd range on the final slash. The single thing making Margit so difficult is his ability to cancel similar windows into an entirely new combo. It reminded me of variations on block strings in a fighting game. Savvy players will delay hits within their combo, making it look like it's over, then start a whole new assault before the frames you can get a hit off. Margate takes advantage of us on an unforeseen level. That is, until the rest of the top 10.
Number 9, Star Scourge Radon. Hurtling like a meteor into the top 10 is Raid Boss Radon. Riddle with Rot, a festival to put the demigod out of his misery is held. You and the boys can ride into battle together, or be like me and refuse allies so you can tango mano y mano with the hulking legend. His size is important to note both for his massive hitboxes and his tremendous speed. He'd better give thanks to that miserable creature heaving him around. Of course, before battle can begin, you'll need to get into range first. I hope you're an evasion expert when it comes to Soul Spears, Arrow Barrages, and Aldrich's Tracking Arrow Ring. Dodge timings are insanely tight, rewarding toggling horseback for the speed you need for arrows. Fail and you lose the reins. That's Radon's specialty, bouncing you off horseback like a ping pong ball, leaving you a helpless sitting duck while he zooms all over. This battle hammered in Torrent's health and revival as a shared Crimson Flask resource, with horseback's ability to close the gap and hack away being unparalleled. Whether Mash and Horsecock or Booty Smack him, the difficulty in consistently dodging his blows is immense. An anti that is only upped in a second phase post Celestial Skydive, following it with tracking Gravity Magic and Gargantuan meters that also track, plus electric waves and shouts annihilating Torrent. Even if you summon and take advantage of Split Aggro, his massive health gains make each blow you take equally risky. Whether raiding or solo doing, this Scourge is a difficulty superstar. Number 8, Lich Dragon Fortisax. The first time you encounter a variant of Fortisax is dangerously early. En route to the capital, his cousin Lanciax pays you a thunderous visit. Seeing damage like that, I knew the difficulty would be electrifying once we met again. Though he's also a great enemy, I'm lumping in Lanciax with Fortisax due to them sharing all but a few moves. Lanciax throws a leaping lightning spear, while Fortisax forks you twice and makes you a shash kebab. They both share a frontal slam with cascading lightning rings, two shocking palm slaps, a quick backhand, a tail sweep for booty huggers, fire breath to the front, underneath himself, and as a threat in the air. They also share a roar summoning tiny lightning AoEs to be wary of. Other than fork over spear, Fortisax adds an extra layer to the roar by summoning personal shocks on you, forcing you to run away or dodge at the perfect time. He'll also add in death clouds to the electrified arena, making careless movement as it's forced upon you quite deadly. Between their colossal size and damage output, high mobility, and propensity to cut yours in turn with their roars, defeating these dragons is a doozy. I found it best to snuggle the groin as it removed the tails and palm slaps from the equation. The trade-off is almost certainly getting hit by the lightning slam and being forced out during roars. No matter your tactics, mistakes here throw you into a healing spiral that can quickly snowball. They pose a tremendous threat, nearly taking the title of hardest dragon boss in Elden Ring. That honor instead goes to our number 7 entry, Dragonlord Placidusax. One head short of Ghidorah, this draconic parallel to the two fingers has a monstrous moveset. Similar to Fortisax, he'll roar and summon a storm. He trades the small AoEs for a bigger model, including three consecutive directly under yourself. The skill gap here is huge as you can actually time blows between sharp dodges for a punish. He has a lightning swipe that can combo into a second or result in a 90 degree fire breath left turn. Getting under the body during the swipes or running to the right offers a fair window. Just be wary of him shooting fire behind his back or swiping with the tail. Enjoy them while they last because these counter opportunities start to go out the window during Phase 2's Disappearing Act. The Titan turns to dust in an instant, leaving you rot with terror as an ominous cloud suddenly bears a rocketing placidu sax in your direction. From there, welcome to Teleport Town, a haven of a giant that should lack speed phasing in and out of reality instantly, slashing you the moment he appears. Tracking his approach and hustling toward him while managing stamina becomes vital for melee builds. It all climaxes in a breath bonanza that hits harder than any single hit in the game, nearly a one-shot at 50 vitality. Backing this sort of damage with an insane HP total of his own makes every mistake costly. The only reason Placidu Sax isn't higher is how excellent his tells are with fair counter opportunities. That, and I cannot overemphasize how astronomical the difficulty shoots up for our final six. Every entry from here on out killed me at least 15 times and was an absolute slugfest to the very last. Number 6, Morgoth the Omen King. Honing his staff into a blade and adding a lightning spear, lightning spear toss, triple the daggers, and far more lethal combos on an already deadly kit. Morgoth amplifies the demands of the player to heights far beyond his early brawl. One that was already pretty damn hard by the way. <laughs> 
There is some familiarity in that with his moves, yet his speed, rate of attack, combo length, shakeups in those moves, and diminished windows of opportunity on your end feel amplified tenfold. As with his staff, watching the blade like a hawk is crucial. Windups and attack deliveries range from the speed of sound to tortoise level within a single combo. You also need to be vigilant for offhand apparitions. The triple daggers require a dodge now, while the spear toss has a very late delivery. He can also thrust forward with that spear in a push or dash altogether. That dash has a ridiculous hitbox chunking you from the side. His unlimited blade works cross AoE gives a thin margin of opportunity, but it's dangerous to try and take advantage of. It also cuts the arena into a small slice temporarily against a boss with unbelievable pursuit. If you thought that was a lot, it all goes bonkers in phase two. He forces you out with an explosion followed by a second wave. Get used to those as they're now a fixture for the remainder of the battle. You can be handling an eight piece block string while the ground underneath decides it's time to blow its load. His charge slashes return, which are a good opening, but they've added blood flame after effects to increase the danger. The tell for these can be obscured by a new grab, which is brutal in both appearance and damage. It also 180s your camera away from a boss you need eyes on at all times, adding insult to injury. His combos in phase two felt more likely to chain together as well, with hammer slams a previously offered reprieve now being followed by flurry after flurry. The amount of memorization in his off-kilter attack timings, which combos can or can't be followed up upon, and the times when he cancels all that to go ham on a dime is unreal. The ground AoEs add an extra layer of attention already in full demand, healing and damage never feels free due to the rate of his attack and recovery, it was far and away the hardest boss to this point in the game, and we've still got the top five. Number 5, Mog, Lord of Blood. When I initially found Mog, I thought him some moderate conjurer of blood flame and trident swipes. His usage of blood flame to claw and stun the player, toss it for hefty damage, and make a portion of the arena unsafe, and drench the arena in front of him was imposing as were his long draw slaps and thrusts with his trident. Solid, but not too difficult. Turns out that was merely the appetizer to an unimaginable blood fest. The Lord of Blood's design is the exact same as the Fell Omen, with one exception. As you damage him, a trio of rings is cast upon you. If you lean to his left hip and recognize the tell, it is a fantastic opening. You'll want to make the most of it, because he's using your blood to triple tap his way into phase two, a transition that fully hemorrhages you three times in quick succession, demanding immediate healing. He makes you use three of your crimson flasks while stealing that HP and adding it to his own second phase health bar. Trident now coated with blood flame, each blow tosses it around the arena. Previously a mild threat, the arena is spattered with blood flame around every turn. Being bled out is a constant concern, a dire outcome with your diminished healing resources. That's setting aside Mog's new dive and added after effects to all of his attacks. I never once felt like I had the advantage in his second phase. My only recourse was to try to do as much damage as possible in phase one, then play safe in the second while nearly hemorrhaged and pray I could find safe windows to claim victory. While I wouldn't say his move set or overall aggression is more demanding than Morgoth, Mog gets a slight edge for draining healing resources with his transition and to blood soak battle that demands near flawless evasion. Number 4, Malaketh the Black Blade. Destined Death is an appropriate preamble to facing this ferocious beast. Using bestial incantations, including the fearsome Beast Claw, the Beast Clergyman mixes those in with relentless dagger assaults to keep you on your toes. His Rock Sling is particularly dangerous, as it can suddenly follow combos when you think him open. A Frontal Cone and AoE Beast Claw have massive range and require perfect dodging not to be brutalized by the wide hitbox. The dagger attacks are fast and often followed with a slam that allows a guard counter. You can especially take advantage if he goes for the 180 ground carve, shifting behind his left hip for a big opening. Finding these gaps in his moveset is rewarding with Balance Challenge. That balance goes up in flames with his coat as he roars into phase two. Malaketh flies around like Dante from the Devil May Cry series Doggo Edition. While more consistent with his combo timing than other top entries, the ridiculous range of his sword ensures outspacing him is hardly an option. Even if you do, his ranged fire slashes can be tricky to dodge. And anytime you're hit by this fire, not only does it leave a draining HP burn, it reduces your maximum HP. That's an unprecedented double whammy in a battle that can easily defeat you in two to three blows with your whole hog HP bar. The slashes aren't the only burners. 
Nearly every combo is followed with a fire explosion nearby or a judgment cut of slashes that absolutely shreds you. Despite all of this, there is one thing that suppressed his ranking. Before those fearsome flame attacks, he is wide open. If you commit to all out greed, you can sit under him, a few blows will whiff, then if you take the big fire hit and heal immediately, it becomes somewhat easier. That doesn't mean you don't have to dodge after the heal and everything before his long windup happens again for the next burst, but it makes him viable to defeat without mastering his moveset. It's for that reason, despite having less overall difficulty than Morgoth or Mog, that Malekith ranks here. His devastating potential is monumental even with my Ungabunga strategy. Employing it means I did not master this fight, making it likely he'll wreck me much harder than the previous M&Ms when I face him again. Number 3, Radagon of the Golden Order and the Elden Beast. Two finale brawls for the price of one, Radagon and the Elden Beast he guards are a deadly duo. Holy Thor trades meaty hammer blows amidst golden magic, creating an oppressive offensive presence at every range. Openings are only gained from skillful evasion and proper reads. His massive dive and slam, dodge at the right time to hit as he recovers. The backslash into shockwave with the after effect, roll and stay behind for a punish. While these are hardy opportunities, his mix-ups keep you on your toes. He can teleport, creating a stunning shockwave flash, briefly obscuring vision as he's already begun attacking. His magic shots are fast and potent, his lightning spears are delayed and explode shortly after, sometimes even firing them sequentially sequentially with barely a moment's pause almost requiring roll spam. He'll mix that up by slamming the spear in your face, creating a pulsating holy circle. Then there's the grab, utilizing a windup that takes ages only to blitz you instantly. Falling victim means taking a smithing worthy of shattering the Elden Ring. Even if you don't, the explosion after effect will blast you away from a potential opening without a flawless dodge. His enrage features a similar beatdown with a trio of gargantuan frontal shockwave bashes. With proper timing, you can mix offense and evasion to turn the tide. That was the name of the game with Radagon. Screw passivity, show him how you get good. Parry three times to claim that sweet repost. Read his tales and batter him at every turn. My final attempt against him was a no-hit god run. Minimizing flask usage is key for the upcoming battle of beastly attrition. The Elden Beast favors range and magical assaults, wielding a massive blade to be equally lethal at every range similar to Radagon. Fire breath cascading outward, massive sword combos with inconsistent hit counts and finishers from modest to explosive, holy arrows that force you on the run for what feels like forever, quadruple sword beams a la divine dragon, Estelle's celestial detonating mist, and holy rings you must avoid as they close in and race out to avoid a golden nuke. It can do all of this as it summons a homing globe firing holy pellets for an eternity. The damage is minimal, but it's tricky pressure during any number of these imposing assaults. No single attack is individually impossible to deal with. It's how the beast combines them while effortlessly leaving your range that layers on constant pressure. You have to manage your stamina to dodge, get back up close, and be able to attack, all on top of the healing balance over two tough battles to cover any of your mistakes. This brutal gauntlet is a fitting end to this masterpiece, one you'll have to prove every bit of your grown skill to overcome. Number 2, Godskin Duo when it comes to bosses, Elden Ring asks one question with oppressive regularity. What if there were two? 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 My answer will always be why. We've seen over the history of the franchise that balancing a gank battle is nigh impossible. If you need evidence of how significant split aggro is in combat, put the shoe on the other foot. Summoning for bosses, whether phantoms or ashes, makes the challenge plummet downward. As the boss locks in on a single target, the others are free to take an advantage individuals never could. In an attempt at balancing gank bosses, FromSoft typically does two things. Creates a difference in boss speed and effective range. They have opposing strengths and weaknesses, forming a perfect tandem, one not without individual flaws. And number two, litter the arena with pillars for cover, or more importantly, ways to divide and conquer. Point blank, you cannot expect the player to attack two bosses right next to each other without heavy risk of punishment, one that far outweighs the reward. Knowing what we do about Godskin Duo individually, let's see how they adapt this formula. Despite noble stature suggesting lower speed, he's as fast, if not faster, than Apostle. How about range capabilities? Oh right, they both have a fireball they can spam with ease at any time. This makes cover more important than ever to split the duo and block fireballs during singular openings. Now, do you recall how 
they both enrage around 55% HP. Any single one of their phase two exclusive attacks destroy all but the base of the six pillars throughout the arena. This leaves you vulnerable to fireballs at any time, making taking even the biggest of openings a risk. So let's add that up. They both have the same strengths, minimal weaknesses, and are effective at every range. Now I know what you might be thinking, kill one of them and then deal with the other like most gank battles. It's tough, but it's doable. In the case of the Godskin duo, they share a criminally large HP bar. And to down this boss, you need to kill them three and a half times. No, the battle does not end when one dies. They're merely resurrected 15 seconds later. I suppose in theory, you could kill the other in that window, but good luck fighting both fully enraged, balancing their HP back and forth, and being able to effectively greed in that short time frame to end the battle. No, instead I decided, screw the fatty, I'm not having Miltank rollout flashbacks, I'll just keep killing the Apostle until they're dead. A feat which took over 16 minutes in my clear attempt. Something like that should never be necessary. For all the wrong reasons, these individually tough bosses combine in a thoughtless manner, going against the rules set by the developers themselves time and time again to create balance and create a duo well worth the second spot. Despite my hours of attempts against this ungodly gank, even they can't come close to the 44 deaths I suffered at the hands of the hardest boss in Elden Ring, Melania, Goddess of Rot. Heed my words. I am Melania. Blade of Mikola. And I have never known defeat. Hearing those words amidst FromSoft's signature field of flowers indicating you're about to get your shit kicked in, I knew I was in trouble. Little did I know every time trouble struck, it would heal her a lot. Her lifesteal isn't some insignificant recovery. Single lapses in judgment can undo multiple offensive assaults. If you can believe it, this is merely the tip of the iceberg. Think of it this way, if Pinwheel could heal, would you even care? No, of course not. Now what if I told you Ishin the Sword Saint, Dark Eater Madir, or Orphan of Kos healed with every single blow they landed? That is a terrifying suggestion that Melania brings to reality. Reminiscent of Garman's metered aggression, she leaves lulls before sudden quick-step gambits. It varies between long slashes, stabs, slams, and even grabs with the long blade, then sliding it down and creating a twin blade for slashes far too quick to fully evade when she strings them all together. A minor hit might not seem too bad in an exchange, but remember, she's healing every time you make a mistake. Her ability to close the gap and unleash one of these combos quickly is unparalleled in this game. Everything I've said about variations in attack tells, timings, and deliveries is at its roughest with Melania. The only way I found to even the odds was to use a weapon that can stagger her. Even then, she can hyper armor at will into a combo that can undo it all while draining your HP. She is the only boss in the game that had me respect my build in a desperate attempt to find some configuration that would keep her at bay. I found the curved greatswords hit at the perfect pace to stagger some of those secondary hits, keeping you in control as much as possible. Throw all of that out the window against bar none the most difficult attack I've ever dealt with in the series. Leaping into the air, she'll rear back and unleash a bombardment of blows at lightning speed, each doing considerable damage and healing her in turn. She does this three times in a row with hardly any gap in between. The closing speed on this is unbelievable. You can be halfway across the arena and she'll be on top of you by the second volley. Roll into it, out of it, timed underneath it, spam roll, no matter what, you will almost certainly be hit by at least some of it. You can block it too, but have fun as she saps HP from every blow, if your stamina can even withstand it all. The worst part? In her second phase, she embraces her inner rot goddess and adds scarlet rot build up to a few attacks. Guess which one is included? Yeah, triple judgment rot almost signals instant defeat if she uses it. She also adds slams with rot explosions to the front, making openings harder to take. She can throw out six shades from various angles that feel impossible to fully avoid, following with her own lunging stab. Almost all of her combos gain extra hits, and her previously passive aggressive stance is long gone. She's bum rushing you relentlessly while you're begging for a moment to breathe. That moment only comes when she careens to the ground in her Scarlet Blossom, the single saving grace of the second phase. While it keeps melees at bay, you can freely use range capabilities to pile damage on. I upgraded a bleed crossbow solely for this purpose. Just remember, even the finest of openings can be undone at the slightest mistake. 
Melania is the evolution of everything FromSoft has ravaged us with from False King Alant all the way to Ishin the Sword Saint. One of the hardest bosses I've ever faced. Melania's hands down my choice for the most difficult boss in Elden Ring. But of course, that's just my opinion. What are the bosses you found to be the hardest in Elden Ring? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to stay tuned for mini boss, quality, and community rankings to come. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, it helps to spread the content. And of course, I want to thank you for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.